filter in. I, mean, I have a feeling they might be waiting in the wings a little bit for this one. Okay. Oh. Can't say it's me watching chat like an ice hawk. <laughs> which is like a regular hawk, but chillier. Um, yeah, I do want to say again, I was just saying this in the preamble, but dude, thank you so much for coming on the show, yo. My pleasure. Um, Happy to be here. <laughs> considering I was just that random English bloke on a packed show floor being like, you should come on my show, it's on the internet, it's, it's that good. <laughs> it's all good. No, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy to do it. And I will say, uh, if you see any questions in chat that you're like, that is interesting, I want to chat about that, uh, just uh, grab them, uh, just, yeah, help yourself. I, this lot gets I, to hear me talk far too much. <laughs> I don't have I don't have the ability because I'm on my phone. I don't think I have the ability to view the chat at the same time as as having this camera work. So. <laughs> well, then I will <laughs> endeavor to be the best MC that I can. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And and to that deal. So to Martin Night Vale and Jaralan Katros Arden What? I would welcome friends. I got Darren. I got Darren's here. I don't know where the Glaswegian comes from. Oh. Um, oh, Jaralan. Okay, there we go. Jaralan was having some technical problems, but we're fine. Um, but yeah, it's it's actually one of the things that's made me super happy has always been seeing super giant app packs. Like, yeah. Uh, and even if I have said super massive games as many times as I've said super giant <laughs> in video game company names. Um, so yeah. yeah. PAX is always great. I, I really enjoy going to PAX, and, and I I haven't missed many of them since we, since our inception, since our first PAX attendance in 2010. Oh wow! I've been to I've been to every every PAX West except one since 2010, and every wow. PAX East except one since 2011. So yeah, it's like you know I'm a I'm a fan of the PAX. Yeah, I got to do my first in 13. But yep. I kind of, it was one of those weird things of being a fan of a conventional show before I got the chance to attend because, you know, when I was, you know, just working a QA gig and stuff like that, I did not have the cash to fly to Seattle. Yeah. And, of course, yeah. yeah. Ah, those were the bygone days. Yeah, I, I, the, so I never, I've never attended PAX as a civilian. It's always been, uh, it's always been, you know, working, but but it's but it's yeah, it's it's a fun fun way to do it. Oh, dude, Pax a civilian is surreal. Like yeah. especially on like a Sunday, I keep being like, all right, when are we gonna do takedown? Wait, no, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm not responsible for a stand. Yeah, yeah, all yeah, right, yeah. When are we gonna handle? Oh, wait, no, no, I don't have to do that at all. I just get to walk around and see yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, yeah, we we've been doing, you know, the the last this last show was our our sort of biggest in terms of the amount of people from the team who came. I um, can't that, imagine that, why that was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, and so we got to, like, have shifts that were... We, we had entire days off and had we were able to, like... So it was pretty cool. I only ended up working the show for, like, half a day to, for two days. Uh, so I really got to check out, you know, my friends and friends that, who had booths and stuff there and get to go check out my friend's board game you know it's a stuff like that. oh yeah it was a it's a good time that's yeah. really cool fun fun um, to be able to do that and friends i will get into what that reference was in packs in just a second when you know the usual drill friends you've got a few more minutes to get yourself a cup of tea um to uh, get yourself sorted uh before i introduce darren proper and we get into the into the nitty gritty um so tsch numbers dismook what ho friends uh, although TSCTH would like to me to inform you that your beard, your beard is very impressive. Oh, thank you. I yeah, you know I I, uh, I had the chops for probably I don't know seven or eight years back in the day, and then I took you know I moved I had a kid we moved to California and I my kids started going to preschool, and I just felt uncomfortable with like eccentric facial hair like dropping my kid off at, at preschool <laughs> so i grew the full beard and then now that he my kid's back in, he's in public school he's in kindergarten now so i yeah it's like it's time the it's time return. to bring you <laughs> the return i did it like a couple of months ago finally for right it back so it feels good it's like coming home so wraith lovely to see you all lovely to see you 
Yeah, it's so strange. Um, it's so strange talking to a lot of my guests and seeing how, like, you know, the games industry is really growing up. Yeah. It's fascinating now that when you talk to uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the the core individuals, like they have, you know, families, multiple international moves. Like, it's. Uh, it's interesting because I was talking to a friend about like the old like uh, PlayStation era of games, where it was very much perceived that all game creators, especially like musicians and artists, were very mm -hmm. much like these twenty-something, you know, party party till the break of dawn sorts. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. I mean, I think I think there was a time when that was maybe more true, um, but even even if it's just those same people now, they're all they're all older, so. <laughs> You know, you can't. Your hangovers last longer and are more brutal, and you <laughs> can't can't go quite as hard. Who wants to sing and uh, and recover? People have families, and you know yeah. all that stuff. So I do think. Um, I mean, I don't want to throw us off tangent before I've even had the chance to introduce you, but I do mm -hmm. think it's an important thing to to at least highlight a little bit because there are a lot of people who you know in the 30s and 40s who have kids who don't necessarily feel that games is a viable career, and I kind of mm -hmm. want to be like, no, no, you can do this. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't have great um, insight into how one gets into the game industry because I sort of stumbled into it in a strange way um, and, and didn't necessarily pursue it. But, but it is, I mean, it's definitely, there's, there are a lot of people working in this industry and, and depending on where you work, it can be a, like a human 40 hour a week kind of job instead of a an insane some of the horror stories you used to hear about people crunching for 100 hours a week and stuff like that so uh, i've actually so, gone so, back and yeah. reread um the ea widow stories and oh boy yeah yeah so yeah we we we, we try to try to keep it sustainable you know uh, here at least and just usually. everybody everybody yeah if we if we want to keep doing this for the long haul then we, we can't just burn ourselves out constantly you know um so Erebin, that is a very good question i'll ask that second friends you've got about like a minute or so before we do proper introductions and kick off so if you need to grab yourself a, a water a soda the blood of your enemies you've got you've got a couple more minutes um although honestly if you haven't pre-prepared the blood of your enemies it's going to be a stressful morning it's a very <laughs> stressful morning um, though Ehrman was asking like a nice little pre-question, which is, have we ever had a guest that hasn't stumbled in on some fashion? We have. We've had a lot of people who have trained for a discipline, but I, I think a lot of the stories of people, games industry-wise, is that, you know, it's, it's both hard work and timing that come together to put people into a certain position. Yep, absolutely. Like, I, I, I think someone can actively work to, to be in the gaming space and do well, you just might not always know how you're going to do that. Yeah, you might not be able to get it. Yeah, you got to be open to opportunities as they as they come up. Okie dokie. So, friends, individuals of all persuasions and possibly even future enemies, <laughs> it is my esteemed pleasure to introduce you to our guest today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm joined by Darren Corb. A, a an audio smith of renown and um i would be right in saying uh, the lead audio gentleman for uh, super giant games yes that is correct hi hello um now if by some bizarre uh, quirk of fate you have not heard of super giant games see what i did there audio heard of yeah. gotta get that one out of the way because that's a got it joke. Out of the cheap seats. They are the studio responsible for Bastion, Transistor, Pyre, and Hades. A a quadra threat match of games which excel on a number of different fields. Stop at incessant clicking. And my buddy Aspects just gifted a sub to Super Giant Games. So oh, nice. I'm, I'm sorry you've been you, you've been roped into it now. House Carl has spoken. <laughs> Thank you. So. One of the reasons why I was so keen to, to talk to you, one of the things I've been wanted to, to bring you on the show for is the caliber of games that Supergiant makes and how all the different art disciplines for creating a game come together. Now, today we're going to be talking mostly about your work, about the audio work, the music you've created, 
and how that came to be. But mm -hmm. as I'm sure you can understand, I'm very excited for this one. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, so let's start very quickly with a little primer for people. You were saying your path in was a little bit different from most. So how did you fall into this? Yeah. Uh, so I, before I was immediately before I was working on super giant stuff, yeah. I was pretty recently out of college, just trying to work, um, in any way that I could in music. I was living in New York. I had just finished NYU and I'd studied music production and music business, more or less, like a sort of mix of things. And uh, I was mostly like writing songs, trying to be kind of a producer, songwriter, performer. I was playing gigs as a hired musician sometimes, um, just kind of, I was interning in a recording studio, um, trying to do anything I could related to recording and you know, writing and performing music. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, wrote a musical with my brother and did some other, you know, <laughs> working on stuff, it, just little projects here and there. I had a band and all that. Um, and then my good longtime childhood friend, Amir Rao, is the co-founder of Supergiant Games. We've been friends since we were eight years old. He uh, reached out. He was working at EALA at the time on the Command and Conquer series. Yeah. And he and a couple other guys from EA were planning on starting a, a company. And he just asked me to do all of the audio for it because he thought I could. You know, we'd played together in bands for years and, and worked together creatively on, on other stuff and played D&D &D together for forever and and still do. And uh, and he just, he just asked me to do it. And I... I um, didn't necessarily have qualifications at that time to do it because I didn't have experience doing sound design. I had done, you know, acting growing up. I was in like musicals and stuff and, and did, did that kind of thing. So the voiceover thing was like sort of related to stuff I'd done a little bit, but I'd never really done that either. But, you know, and the music thing I'd never done, I hadn't done a lot of composing, but I've done a lot of, I'd done a lot of songwriting and producing. So, so I just sort of, said yes and like okay here we go let's i'll learn how to do this as as i go um and i just tried to approach it in in ways that i that i understood how, how to do it from sort of a production and a songwriting uh, standpoint and that's yeah that's how i got in i i just my buddy that i've been friends with forever asked me to to work on his thing he was working on hmm. well and not to jump several questions ahead but just to mm -hmm. more for flow do you think having a strong relationship with the core founder was what helped both the music and audio design of Supergiant's games become such a core part? Like the thing that I really want to dive into today is that mm -hmm. one thing that has been consistent throughout Supergiant's catalog is that all the disciplines seem to be working in harmony. You know, the sound design of Bastion blew everyone away, but not just in a dead space way where you know just the the ambient sound design was exceptional i mean mm. i couldn't tell you a feckin song from the dead space soundtrack you know what i mean okay and yeah. the voice acting for isaac clark could pretty much have been summed up with um you know unity's default texture but a human voice mm -hmm. with bastion what was achieved with the resources available was incredible exceptional how did you manage to make audio music such a core part of the experience how did you make that how did you bring that together be it both from a production and from a creative this is what i want to get into yeah We're doing it sure yeah <laughs> yeah i well so i think it you know at the beginning and and then moving forward to some to a lesser degree you know a lot of our decisions that we've made are based on sort of leaning into the strengths that we have on team and what everybody on team can execute. And because I was involved right away at the beginning of Bastion, that was an asset, you know, that we had. I could I could make a bunch of music and I could try to use that to um, reinforce the tone that we were reaching for uh, and try to create or at least assist in creating a vibe uh, that, that helped put you in this place that we were trying to create. 
And so I, I think a lot of that honestly comes from just trying to play to the strengths of each of the individual members on our team and and allow everybody to sort of um, flourish in their own in their own discipline, if that makes sense. No, it absolutely does. It's um, in the environments where I've worked in, uh, audio has been uh, a very separate discipline. Mm -hmm. um, at Supergiant, um, how involved are you when it comes to discussion of like uh, the core concept? Uh, at what point do you start talking about the flavor, the feel, be it musically or just in terms of audio? Um, right away, I mean, the, the sort of the sort of uh, tone of the project is something that is developed immediately in tandem with every every other aspect at the beginning of the product. That's something that we're we begin exploring instantly, and and we're not we don't just prototype in a vacuum right away. It's it's you know prototyping. We start you know on a new project, we'll start prototyping, but we'll do it with I'll start making music. Yeah, that is reaching for the sort of ideas that we've discussed tonally and the, and the type of setting that we've discussed tonally you know, uh, and, and trying to figure out what the music would sound like, what the palette of instruments would be, what the sound effects would be and how, you know, how, how they would help express the feeling of the world. Yeah. Could you take us through a little bit of that process? Let's, let's use transistor as the, uh, the example, because, mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. Could you take us through a little bit of how that process went for Transistor? Yeah, so for for Transistor, you know, it was uh, it was our second game, so we all felt a lot of pressure after Bastion to make something that was sufficiently different enough from Bastion, so that people wouldn't think we were repeating ourselves, but was similar enough to Bastion, so that if people who liked Bastion may might still like this thing. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that makes dead sense. easy, dead easy. That yeah, yeah. It was so <laughs> so. It, we, it was a tightrope kind of walk, and and you know, on Bastion, a lot of our decisions that we made were really easy to make because we didn't have to deliberate on them because we just did the thing that we were all best capable of doing, that would help serve the idea of the thing. Um, for Transistor, if we'd done everything that was sort of the most in our wheelhouse on Bastion then this one was sort of like we had to reach a little bit more creatively so 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 we we spent a long time in pre-production on, on transistor a really long time and i personally spent at least six months prototyping the music and figuring out making piece after piece and and just kind of figuring out where the the sort of tonal center of the music was going to be and what what that palette was going to end up being like to help and try to express, you know, the the place that that we wanted to put the yeah. player in. And I wouldn't be remiss in saying that that was happening like step in step with pre-production for the project as a whole. Yes, yeah. It was, everybody was all doing pre-production, and and you know, Jen was doing concepts, and we, Greg was doing story stuff, and you know, we were prototyping, and all that stuff was all happening at the same time. Yeah. Uh, also, very quickly, dear friends, um, we will be doing a, a quick round of questions towards the end of the show. So if you've got any of them, keep them in mind, stash them. We've only got Darren for an hour, so I'm trying to be the least amount of rambling willow that I can. Um, so you were saying, you were talking about like uh, creating in a vacuum. Now, again, I'm not dissing on any of the audio individuals that I've worked at, at previous studios, but you know because of the discipline and its very specific skill sets to understand it from bad like how much did you work with the rest of the studio when it came to these prototyping elements yeah i mean i think it uh it really depends it depends on the project i think uh on bastion there was the most like back and forth i'd say because i would sort of pitch some i would i would go away and make something i'd sort of get like you know, some requests, like we need this kind of uh, music for this purpose, we need music for this purpose, we need music for this purpose, um, sound effects for all this kind of stuff. And I would go and make it. Uh, now a lot of that stuff, I sort of determine myself or Greg will will sort of pitch me like, hey, we could use some coverage for these things uh, sound wise. But, but for the most part now, um, or, or sorry, for the most part during Bastion, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was very much like, it was very iterative. 
I would send some stuff, make some revisions, maybe, or 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 at least um, there'd be requests. And and I was constantly pitching music over the wall to for everybody to listen to. And I was constantly playing the game to hear how it was being implemented in context. And I had notes about that. So so yeah, it was. I mean, a, a lot of the that's similar to to our current process. Is it, you know, it's it's highly iterative, and um, and we we you know like to get everything sort of in the game in context as quickly as possible so that we can evaluate it and, and update it if we if we feel we need okay cool um let's touch on um uh, voice work very quickly um mm -hmm. it's something that all the super giant games that have have done incredibly well awesome. now thank you where did that come from in bastion because i think that was you were yep. saying earlier that everyone was working to their skills yeah. Who had the who had the skills and the hooks to make that voice cool. come to life? That is Logan Cunningham, uh, and we went to high school together. And Amir and Logan played soccer together, I believe, when they were 12, 12 or something. And Logan and I were roommates in New York at the time that I began work on Bastion, and we were sort of trying to figure out how to convey story in an action RPG without having to stop the gameplay so that you could you just read a wall of text. And we wanted to try to find a way around that if we could. Um, and so somebody had the idea of, of the narrator and, and I thought, Hey, you know, Logan's a fantastic actor and lives 10 feet from me. So maybe I could get him to come to my room and record some, some stuff, you know, let's give that a shot. He was up for it. And yeah, uh, right away we tested it out, and uh, it felt pretty cool. Um, so we we started kind of leaning into that, and decided that that was going to be a, how we conveyed the narrative in this game. Well, and something I'd like to ask about that is the narrative, as it has been used throughout the Super Giant games, has remained a consistent level. Um, how did you avoid bloat creep in that sphere? Because you know, the narrator of Bastion was something that, especially when it first hit the scene, everyone mm -hmm. raved about. You know, mm -hmm. how did you avoid that not uh, spiraling out of control? You know how other studios, if they had a win yeah. like that, might double down on it. It, it would be yeah. very easy to be like, more actors, more voiceover. Yeah. How yeah. did you avoid I mean, that that scope creep? I think uh, part of the, the thing that we try to do is we try to be pretty realistic about... Um, what we'll, we can accomplish is as a small team and we try to you know we've got to we have to make choices about what we're going to be able to do and realistically not going to be able to do in the the span of time that we have to to make a, a project um so i think uh you know we we've tried to mix it up from project to project too like we bastion after bastion we we were pretty um resistant to the idea of making just a, just a sequel and being the studio that makes bastion forever you know um and we wanted to try and branch out and 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 ex explore something new and and we knew we were taking a risk doing that but you know we just it was important to us to try to explore we had a lot more different kinds of ideas and, and wanted to explore them and and i think each game has its own sort of set of narrative requirements and they're not the same you know even though we did it was transistor was voiceover heavy sort of the the storytelling device is pretty different because instead of an omniscient narrator it's somebody who is a character in the scene with you experiencing it as you do so you can't reveal the story in quite the same way uh, as you could with an omniscient narrator for example so there are different challenges with that and then with pyre you know we had one english speaking character essentially and a bunch of we had a bunch of voice actors but it was like they came in and did like one session where they recorded this made-up language and then we chop it up and use it in different contexts and yeah and for hades we actually this is our first fully voiced game where like all the characters are voiced in english and by far already has more lines than any other game we've ever done um and I think part of that is that we've refined our process to the point where now, now we can take on something that has more scope to it because 
the process has been streamlined. We've done it enough that we feel confident in being able to turn around high quality stuff quickly. I, uh, I hesitate to ever say asset pipeline because it makes people twitch, but when yeah, your yeah. asset pipeline is smooth. Um, yeah, yeah. Very quickly, I just want to say hi to here is the people Dan Jones, Crit Fumble, and a bunch of people who've come on in. If you've just joined us, this is Darren Cobb. Made a bunch of music and audio and cool stuff for a bunch of cool games. We're talking about process and making things happen. Um, so that was something that I did want to talk about was mm -hmm. Hades is also the first early access title we've worked at. Yes. Now, yeah. how's that been? Because I am not musically gifted. I have never put forward an album. Uh, the only thing I'm known for is terribly singing Don't Stop Me Now at karaoke. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good, solid karaoke choice. That's Thank a good you. one. Thank you. But uh, having yeah. your music, audio, and VO, having all of that process available during an early access project, like, that's got to be, one, daunting, and two, how does that change how you work? You know, people get to hear the concept album. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and it's really, I really enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, we're, we're trying to pace ourselves, you know, because we know it's a long haul situation. And if we, if we crunch for every single update, you know, then we're going to burn out by the end of the project and, and, yeah. and you're constantly shipping something every month or two, you know, <laughs> so you can't have like a week of crunch every month or two. Um, so we're, we're really trying to keep it uh, manageable. But at the same time, it's really fun for me to be able to let people hear the music I'm making basically right away. I and mean, we had the year, of, the initial online. year or so of, of All systems production, uh, and then we launched into early access in December of it appears last I am year. Right. Just gonna sneak in a and, side raise your music December, is no, loud enough year, for me to have the vinyl tongue. I am and, so uh, sorry about that. I just had a, a minor feck up there. I do apologize. Um, so Tikatu, thank you kindly for the uh, the sub there. Sorry, it uh, my alerts went fecking sideways and it interrupted <laughs> your whole vibe, so I apologize. Oh, that's all right. Um, you were saying uh, on, on getting people to experience them early. Yeah, so it's, it's exciting to get people to experience the music I've made kind of right away and the and the voiceover stuff and all this stuff. I mean, to get the instant feedback about that, it's really fun because normally, you know, on something like Pyre, we work on it for three years and I make a bunch of music and I don't know if people are going to like it. I don't know what, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a different style. It's a different, so it's it's been fun to ha get a more sort of, uh, a sort of swift feedback loop, like a smaller mm -hmm. feedback loop. Um, it's been pretty cool. Uh, and and for me, I really like the cadence. I like the deadlines. I really like having to just sort of go and not have time to second guess myself creatively. I think that's a really, it's a really, yeah, it's a really uh, satisfying way to work for me because I think oftentimes creatively, I feel like people's first instincts are good and right. And, and to ignore, I mean, the ten, the sort of, uh, for me at least a tendency would be to ignore that or to to dismiss it as like eh, it can't be i mean no let me i'm gonna find something better you know and uh but i think oftentimes the the thing that that not you know that pops into your head immediately if you if you kind of mine it and refine it can be can be the right the right thing so yeah it's been a refreshing fun way to, for me to work um and i really like having sort of a variety of things to do every month mm. or two uh you know having and some sort of vo sound effects music yeah. updates every you know it's, you're not it's, worried it's really about fun. um you're not worried about having like the uh, the remastered album problem of creating a track or you know creating a certain sound and a certain feel to a an environmental scene that is then changed or refined later on that may result in that you know the remastered album where artists go back rework mm -hmm. their stuff and while it is from a technical standpoint better it loses mm. it can lose its charm it can also lose the 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 imperfections which become the hooks which draw people in are you sure are you worried about that problem with with an early access title i mean for the music i'm approaching the music as as when i'm releasing the singles on you we're releasing the singles as we go on sort of youtube and spotify and i'm considering those to be done like i'm i don't plan i'm like finishing those to the best of my ability before i kick them out the door so so i do my plan is not to go back and revise anything um musically uh 
in the game, maybe, you know, if there's some reason to do it, I, I would, I would do it, but, or, you know, we might change the way something in which something is used or the, the placement of something in the game. But, but I think for the most part, the music that is, you know, mastered and finished and put up online for people is I'm, 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 I like to think of it as done. <laughs> um, and so that kind of going back and sort of fixing it later is not really an option yeah. uh, for, for me as far as, as, far as I'm concerned, because I, I am aware of that too. I mean, you know, I, I, um, I don't want to get into it too much, but you know, Star Wars, for example. <laughs> Mate, you're my guest. I'm, I'm, I'm here to hear feels. <laughs> you know, I the the original Star Wars movies are, you know, obviously a, as they were originally are very important to me, and I'm mm. like a whole generation of other people. And then, you know, if if as the creator of those things, if you feel unsatisfied by them, maybe they piss you off. But you know, a whole generation of people fell in love with them, so. It's not really yours anymore. It's sort of my view, and not to compare my stuff to Star Wars. No, no, <laughs> anyway, but it's but... <laughs> it's an important one, and it, it Star Wars does make for a good hyperbole example. Also, yeah. uh, one of the things they've never changed in Star Wars is the music. Just saying, yeah. just That's saying. True. Yeah, John Williams still um, still rocking it. Yeah. So, we can do a technical question, then fluffy question. So, technical question. One of the things that I'd like to equip anyone watching today or people watching forward is how could they help incorporate like sound design as part of their of their conceptual processes thinking from the project so you're like i have this idea or you know i am part of a team how do i help mm -hmm. fold in audio design uh, music theory how do i bring this all in better what if was you said you knew the the person mm -hmm. who owned the space mm -hmm. so i guess what i'm trying to do with today is equip people with the tools they need to bring these different disciplines together. Yeah. Is there any tips you can offer people? I think one seemingly obvious one is to involve all the disciplines as early as you can on the project so that they have uh, the ability to, the uh, you know, sort of absorb as much as possible of what the project is about, what the feeling of it is. Um, and specifically with sound design, I think, you know, being mindful of the other disciplines while you are doing your thing is is really valuable. You know, thinking about when you are designing something, for example, for designing an enemy, like what kind of sounds does the enemy need to make? How are they going to locomote? Are they going to walk? Are they going to float? Are they going to need footsteps? Are they going to need ambient? Do you want there to be like ambient sound coming from them? Do you want so? I mean, it's not something that that a designer needs to. They don't need to, that. Doesn't need to be prescribed. But but just thinking about all that stuff, being mindful of it while you're doing your thing is is a good um, a good idea. I think. Of course, I'm a little biased because I'm you know I do the sounds. But um... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and that's why I wanted to bring you on. Like, yep. so often, so often when interacting with the development team, there is this there is this feeling that it's pretty much just you know core it's core feature design and mm. then the other disciplines are kind of bolted on so mm. often like the mm. audio teams the last people brought in on something yeah and like yeah yeah I, well I, I you know I, I think in a lot of cases <laughs> uh uh unless you're a giant company uh audio is often contracted mm. and not even part of the actual team um and that's part of why it is brought in late, uh, especially music, because not a lot of small studios or even large studios, for that matter, have an in-house composer. Um, so just sort of by the nature of the way a development cycle happens, uh, if you have someone, if you're outsourcing that stuff, it's it's not totally possible. I mean, there are there are exceptions, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's it's not as easy to involve someone deeply with the rest of the development process. If that's, you know, if someone is freelancing and working on a bunch of different projects, for example, unable to have access to play the game throughout development or doesn't have access to all the world documents and all the fiction and all the, you know, that stuff, uh, it's going to be more challenging to have something that feels integrated, I think. Um, at least from my experience, you know, that, that stuff's all really helpful uh to to try to 
have the music both integrate into the world and help sort of define the place and the yeah. setting of the world. Also, um, so Petula Petula was saying in chat, was making a point, just as an offhand joke of being like, also be friends with people who have amazing voices. But I guess what I wanted to do was just re-highlight what you said earlier in the show, which is work to the strengths of the people you have around you. Yep. You might not have someone who is a trained voice actor, but you might have that person who's got that really just, that, that really unique voice, and then maybe a way to fold that into the project you're making. Working yep. with the people, ah, oh, it's the Popo. God darn it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've given away too many of the games industry secrets. I'm going to kind of game jail. Yeah. It's totally fine. Look, I used to live for the first two <laughs> games. For Bastion and Transistor, we recorded everything in my apart my Brooklyn apartment. Oh, um, dude. And so we had to stop for a lot of sirens. Uh, I lived on Myrtle Avenue in Brooklyn, which is a lot of the high, high siren traffic area. <laughs> How did you do that? Just like soundproof a room, make a tiny booth? Mm -mm. Nope, oh. no soundproof. It was, so I had a closet <laughs> with that opened, you know, without like doors opened out. The two doors is like a, I guess a California style closet. I don't know where it had the two doors that opened out, and I hung heavy blankets on both of those doors, and had a microphone in the closet, and Logan would just like you know that would do it with the back to his back to the, my bedroom, you know. Back and out. And I would be across the apartment with on, you know, I'd run, I ran a long cable across the apartment to my little office that I had where I had my desk and headphones and a little talkback mic. Um, That's so cool! Yeah, and so we just did it all in my apartment. <coughs> and, and, and some of Bastion was actually recorded in the apartment that Logan and I shared, which was, uh, which was like a like, tiny little rat hole. And I had a loft bed and my desk was under my loft bed. And... I, we recorded it in my room. I would put blankets all over, like on the floor and the walls. I had like grommets and I put moving blankets on the walls. And then I hung like a comforter off the side of my bed, like between to separate the computer from the microphone area. You know? <laughs> so uh, there, a, a little bit of Bastion was recorded that way. Too. Yeah. Oh, uh, so. <clears throat> So, Wymus and friends, uh, we are going to be opening up the floor to, to questions and compliments in a little bit. So, do bear with if you've got any uh, questions for Darren. Uh, while I apparently seem to have the most monstrous frog in my throat. It's brilliant. Um, but, I just want to touch a little bit on what you were saying there. Which is, it can be very easy to think of creating, video creating music in that regard as only being something you can do with a proper studio, with a huge setup, with lots of people. What you were saying there is Bastion's iconic... VO was made in a closet <laughs> and, and a the music. makeshift setup. That, the music as well. Yeah, yeah. that's feckin' brilliant. And if we look at things like, um, I'm gonna pull a game out of left field here, Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy. What he does with kind of his like poetry style of VO throughout that adds something to what would otherwise be just a meme heavy, like bloke in a cauldron being an ass. <laughs> and just, I guess what I'm trying to do is just reinforce the point you were making earlier about bringing these disciplines together, yo. So, yeah. now a fluffy question. How was it doing an on-stage performance with a full orchestra? Uh, crazy. Yeah, it was nuts. Um, yeah, so for people who uh, don't know, we did a 10-year uh, anniversary celebration performance at PAX West with the 13-piece chamber orchestra conducted by Austin Wintry. Uh, and Ashley and I uh, sang, you know, we did songs from every single game, uh, 10, 10 plus tunes. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it was just an incredible experience. I'd never done anything like that. Um, you know, Ashley and I have some experience playing shows, just the two of us, with, like more intimate, kind of smaller venues. The biggest show I think we'd played before that was maybe a few hundred people. Um, but at the pair, you know, we were at the Paramount Theater in Seattle, and it was pretty full, and it was like twenty five hundred people, you know. <laughs> yeah, dude, um, it was huge. How did that? It was really crazy. How did that come about? Like just singing a couple of beers one night and be like, <laughs> "What if we got an orchestra?" <laughs> well, I think I think we wanted to try and do something kind of big and special for our ten year anniversary, um, and you know, I just kind of somebody I think it was probably Michael, our former. Um, uh, operations director who maybe pitched the idea of doing something orchestral to me and i was like well that doesn't i don't know that seems we'd have to do a lot of work and 
I don't know how to do that. And so I, I, I pinged Austin Wintry, who's, who's a friend of mine, and, and started asking him, like, hey, would how would I do this? Like, what what would need to happen? And he's like, first of all, I'm going to conduct it. I, I, I want to be involved. You know? <laughs> and and, uh, and so he, he hooked me up with an arranger, and we he helped me, like, contract musicians and get go through the whole process because he just he does that all the time that's that's his wheelhouse so um so yeah it was just it was a ton of fun to put together and it was a real treat for me to hear the the music in a in a way that was different than i conceived it and and really super satisfying to to do sort of a big uh live performance of this stuff um of, of that scale was super awesome and, and we had another friend of mine make incredible visuals for the thing and oh, yeah, yeah it was it was, uh, it was a blast uh, i'm very happy that i got to be there for that and um it was it was a phenomenal show so i mean one thank awesome. you but two that's i guess another one of the of will's takeaways that i hope people who are watching now watching the future take away is that audio out of a makeshift closet to live orchestral performance like, yep. I'm not saying that it was some mystical, magical force. It wasn't like you suddenly inherited the powers of lightning and now you get to go to PAX and do these things and there's, like, voice actors. It was yep. a small setup in a in your apartment in New York yep. through to yep. that people moving into game development, people moving into audio in that space, it's really easy to look at the end result of a... Uh, I mean, you've been with Supergiant 10, 15 years? Yeah, we started um, the, as a studio in 2009, and I was there right at the beginning. Yeah, and it's easy to look yeah. at your projects now and think that that's an impossible feat, but far from it, far from it. Absolutely, and, and you know, I, I mentioned um, I, spent, I spent some time re uh, interning in a recording studio in New York, and one for me, like, one of the most valuable parts of that experience for me was learning that hey i could probably just do this at home myself and re and achieve like equal or better results than this because because one thing i noticed is you know in the studio there's a lot of time pressure and there's sort of a rigid way of doing stuff and you're sort of paying you know you're paying a lot of money to be in there and 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 have access to this stuff and honestly if you're able to just the technology at that time and now especially even more so is at a point where you can really accomplish a ton of incredible stuff if you just have the time and some software and like some cheap gear you can really you know close that gap that quality gap and and really uh achieve something that's more probably both more unique and uh and even of a higher quality potentially than something you could achieve in a high-end expensive recording studio with a bunch of gear you know of course you know as an aside i love expensive like playing with expensive gear is amazing but <laughs> <Who freaking> doesn't? <laughs> but it's it's just not essential to cr making good sounding interesting stuff the the guitar i used on bastion i owned a nicer guitar than the one i used <laughs> on the bastion soundtrack i used the 200 dollars acoustic that i had since i was 12 that for whatever reason just sounded cool when you tuned it down a bunch and it sounded like a crappy old guitar like it helped sell the vibe of the place you know it should sound like a crappy old guitar and not like a fancy guitar you know yeah <laughs> so 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 that was that, that was something that definitely i'd really love to for people to, to take away uh, in general is that you do not need a bunch of gear and i still don't even have a bunch of fancy stuff that i use to to do what i do um you know, I, you just need sort of an under, like a some software or hardware that you're really comfortable familiar with, and to just experiment with it and and kind of dive in. Um, Sorry, I was chortling because you were saying like you know experimenting with hardware, uh, and uh, Wymus and Petula were both like, hey, Darren, when are you gonna put some cannons in your game? <laughs> Go full Tchaikovsky, get a fucking get an artillery cannons, piece. Yeah, okay. I do. I mean, I do have uh, Canon samples that I've used before, mostly in sound design, not in, not in, uh, not in the music yet. But uh, yet, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, true. and individuals of all persuasions, yet the I, magical. I words. did. I did use. Uh, I did use pickaxes as percussion in, in Bastion at one point. So what? You never know. When was what? 
Mine win bag mine. Just pickaxes. <laughs> right at the beginning, yeah. Back and they be, and then they become the the percussion of the uh, thing. So, Fredos, as we're moving into uh, into the last fifteen minutes, Darren, I have some pre cooked questions from my lot. Mm-hmm. And ladies and gentlemen of chat, if you want to think of some questions, um, uh, I'll I'll open the floor in chat once I've gotten through a few of the uh, the pre cooked ones. Just. Make sure to at Viking Blonde so I don't miss them because I know when you'll get talking, you'll get talking fast. Oh, I, but Dash was saying, uh, Mine Windbag Mine is probably my favorite track on that soundtrack. Awesome. Um, and the thing that uh, Tika2 sent through via their sub message was they just wanted to say that your music is rad. Rad enough oh, that they you. actually bought one of the, uh, the they bought the, the full vinyl set. Whoa, awesome. That's so cool. Right? Um, I'm, exci- I'm so excited to see that thing. That's going to be cool. All right. So a couple of these will be uh, quick fire ones. Like so far, what is the favorite track you've made for a sh- for, for one of the Super Giant titles? It's a very hard, hard question. Uh, <laughs> well, it's not like, which do you think is your best, but which was the most fun? Which was your the favorite? Most fun? One? I really enjoyed uh, making, you know, I really... This is kind of a cop out. A lot of the Hades tunes. I'm just gonna pick like God of the Dead um, as as a tune that's that was just a blast to make because I, I get to I get to play a bunch of drums uh, on this soundtrack and and do just kind of silly, not silly, but you know, kind of you know rock <laughs> kind of stuff that I don't 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 often get to do. So so that's that's been a blast. So I will say just because I'm working on it now and and it's still fresh, uh, maybe God of the Dead. Way cool, way cool. Um, I've got a, a really interesting one here to throw at you. So, Darren, will we see any more acoustic frontier trip hop from you soon? Uh, it depends. You know, it, it, if uh, for a game, it would have to be appropriate to the to the world of the game. You know, so so uh, I don't know <laughs> is the answer. Not for Hades is 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 something I could probably say with certainty but um yeah i'm, I'm you know who knows <laughs> um is there a, an ip or a dream project you'd love to get your hands on i mean just a mystical future like you know mr mr video games is knocking being like what do you want yeah mr video games maybe you know so so like i mean i guess the the, the actual answer is probably no but you know, something like if they were to make a, a Fallout game that was like Fallout 2. Oh! You know what I mean? Like, if there were to be, like, a that kind of a thing, uh, I'd be, I'd be, like, Fallout, that game is, like, one of my favorite games of all time. So, you know, the the, the sort of first-person newer um, games are not my, my speed as much, yeah. uh, but open-world thing. But, but, um, but man, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that. Yeah, also, very quickly, Ticket 2, you have nothing to apologize for. That was on my fault. Uh, I mixed the audio for this interview wrong, which resulted in that super loud setup, so I do apologize. Uh, right. Uh, stuff and things and stuff. Alrighty. Um, someone was asking, um, what was the mindset when you were creating the track Never to Return? Mm. Uh, yeah, that one was a tricky one because I knew that we wanted to have a song we were gonna have these two bard characters in pyre and we wanted to have sort of like a bard off hmm. vibe where they're competing like both bards like representing each side singing together in a sort of duet um was sort of the, one of the initial ideas and so you know there's the two parts and the way it's mixed is sort of the more close you get to one side of the field you know or one side of the the the, the arena uh and then the other you'll hear one bard more prominently the other one you're in the middle you're kind of here both um and also we did different versions i did made different versions of that piece for each triumvirate that you face so you know sort of each one uh the, the lyrics are different based on the team that you're facing uh the, oh, that's freaking cool i didn't know that the, yeah the lyrics and the the arrangement the musical arrangement is different that's um, awesome yeah, so so we we actually released I, I released the the black mandolin uh, uh, thing. It's like a bonus bonus tracks for the Pyre soundtrack, where it's all the different versions of Never to Return 
there's like nine or something if you include the regular soundtrack version that's fucking cool um so as i uh, jump into chat for a couple of little questions um of the uh, of the character voiceovers that you've produced do you uh, do you have a little favorite and that's from uh uh total mr gaming i'm sorry i just I, butchered that i i really like i think the arch justice empire was so much fun to do with logan because it's just a voice that's like so silly and over the top that we really were able to have a lot of fun with it um i really enjoyed that um of course you know all his work on hades is so good and 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 uh and he does like a million characters he's like six characters or something in hades um and yeah it's been really fun uh to do hades uh and the and the sort of storyteller narrator characters in particular cool. on hades um lord lost was wanted to uh, pass along some uh, some compliments saying their favorite track uh, is the mancis dilemma and that they awesome. love all the work in Bastion. And they also got it on vinyl. Awesome. Um, cool. Thank uh, you so much. Actually, onto that, Tika was asking very quickly, like, what is the industry opinion of vinyl? Well, what industry is your opinion? What is your professional opinion on vinyl? I love it. I think it's great. I mean, I think especially at a time where other physical media is feeling kind of obsolete, for me at least, like, I don't have things that can play CDs anymore. Like, I don't have a... Cars don't come with CD... You know, nothing. So CDs are kind of getting phased out. And also because the sort of, for me, the most practical way to use a CD is to rip all the audio onto my computer right away so I can listen to it on whatever I want, you know? Yeah. So, so the fun, fun, vinyl's really fun because music feels so infinite now where you can just like mm -hmm. press play on your music library and it'll just play forever. And, you know, like you just, it's just, you can, it's just a thing that that's become, I think, a lot more casual um that you can passively listen to stuff like in the background and and vinyl demands some active listening which i think is really cool uh not only to being like a big beautiful format with awesome art and a physical thing that you get to have you know even if you don't listen to the vinyl you know just to have it is cool because it's a beautiful piece of artwork you get to support you know this artist that you like but the experience of listening to vinyl you can't you, you sort of have to at least pay attention to it every 15 minutes when you flip the record over, you know, 12 minutes or whatever a side is. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Oh no, sorry. So yeah, yeah. I think that's that's part of part of what what I really um one of the things I really enjoy about vinyl is it forces you to sort of be more engaged uh, with with the music. Well, that's way cool. Um, so I don't expect an answer from this one, but uh, TSCTH was asking. If you were to compose a theme for Will Streaming, what kind of feel would you give it? Oh, gosh. Screaming I don't... incoherently, chat pop. <laughs> uh... We just need to, we probably need to, uh, we just need to talk about, you know, we need, I, need to, I need to sit down and have a... <laughs> yeah. Derek, I can't afford your services. <laughs> um... We'd have to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but moving on to a, a, a wonderful little uh, question by uh, Ryohi. Ryohi? Uh, and they're asking, considering every game has a very different tone to it musically and in terms of genre, did any of the game's soundtracks give you trouble composing or push you out of your comfort zone? Also, they wanted to say, Darren, they listen to your, your soundtrack work on the daily and they love Pyre. Awesome. Thank so you so is much. There a, is there one of the soundtracks that pushed you way out of comfort zone? I mean, I would say Transistor uh, probably was the, the one where I had to, I, I struggled the most to get there. Uh, once I did, I felt comfortable, but but for sure it was it was the hardest fought to achieve uh, the the tone of that, that music, I think. Mm. Um, just because it was something I didn't have, I didn't feel like I had as much experience doing that kind of thing um, as I did sort of guitar-based, you know, bluesy stuff was like, that just was under my fingers from guitar lessons as a kid or whatever. You know what I mean? That stuff's just like, you know, yeah, you can do like a little pentatonic riff all, all day, you know, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, the transistor stuff, I was really, I was really going for something very specific. Um, and I was trying to sort of not emulate, but at least evoke some of the feelings that artists like Imogen Heap and Bjork and Radiohead and people like that sort of evoke in me when I listen to them and um and try to embody this fictional musician character who's supposed to be like this 
iconic, you know, pop star for this, you know, this whole society. So, so it was, it was a lot of, a lot of hoops to jump through to get there. But, um, and it took me a while, but once I, once I did, I was, I was pleased with, with how it turned, how it turned out. Um, jumping back in. So just very quickly, uh, Wymus, uh, Wymus was asking about, uh, Transistor, but it was a lot of the stuff that we covered very on in the show. So Wymus, mm -hmm. this will be available as a highlight or on the YouTubes after the fact. So if you want to go back and give that uh, a read, because I mean, Darren, you already nailed those questions before they were even asked. That's time Perfect. travel. Mind, yeah. <laughs> um, Lady Lecter, how are you doing? Um, Lecter was also at the uh, the big bombastic PAX gig. Awesome. Uh, I've never seen someone guard a signed poster with such fever before. <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, Rio was also asking, uh, how do you feel about fans trying to guess who uh, Zagarius' voice actor was? Oh, uh, to guess about Zagarius' voice actor? Yeah. Um, yeah, the cool i mean uh, that's awesome you know uh i was so i do the voice for zagreus um in in hades which is which is a fun thing you know i haven't i did i did some stuff on pyre but that's like not in english so it's you know it's it's it, it can hide a lot um but yeah doing zagreus uh it was one of those things where i just did a scratch we were trying to figure out what Zagreus was going to sound like, and I just did a scratch voiceover, and we mm. we had we had some people audition, and and we just didn't feel like the team just sort of liked my voiceover the best, so we just I just kept doing it, and now I've been doing it for for a long time, for like almost two, you know two years, mm. um, and have recorded thousands of lines and stuff. So so, but yeah, to, to answer the question more directly, uh, it was awesome to hear to hear people's guesses about who it might be, uh, you know, the dude from. Battlestar Galactica or whatever it was one of the <laughs> like the, the guy a Star Racker guy um, and and some other stuff yeah I was like yeah that's cool um, that, that's cool that people weren't like ah oh, that's I know who that is you know <laughs> um, someone was asking if you have any particularly fond or amusing anecdotes from working with Ashley Barrett sorry can you repeat the question I missed the last part oh uh, from working with Ashley Barrett are there any tales that spring to mind oh yeah I mean. Ashley, it's been great working with Ashley. You know, we we've um, we've worked together. We worked together on a little project uh, I did before Bastion, where I'd, I'd written a musical with my brother and was recording a little demo album of that. And and I had her come. We, we had mutual friends because um, we both grew up in the Bay Area and did musical theater with the same group of people. We didn't know each other then, but we we sort of met in New York for this project. And and when I was working on Bastion, I thought, man, the voice would be great for this. So. You know, I called her up, and we've been working together uh, in in that capacity ever since. Um, I'm trying to think. Like we we have a lot of fun doing shows, um, and just like getting that stuff together. We have a dream to do a set of a, an entire set of '80s TV theme songs covers, and that that's all it would be. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fucking great. Growing Pains, Full House, Family Matters, Gummy Bear, you know, like, uh, it, it, the list goes on and on. There's some great, Perfect Strangers, Step by Step, you know. <laughs> um, so we, 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 we thought about that. Um, yeah, we, and we'll sometimes to warm up, we'll, we'll play like, show me that smile again, you know. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not. I think that's spot on. Uh, Lady Lecter also wanted to add that back on the, the PAX concert, that, that was a very special moment for them. That they cried, awesome. the friend cried, the stranger next to him cried. <laughs> it, I mean, it was an experience. That's so cool to hear. Thank you. Uh, Dark Thelms, who was asking very quickly, do you have a favorite genre of games? Gosh. Um, these days, well, you know, I often really like turn-based tactical uh, stuff. Um, I dig uh, CCG stuff often. Um, like a game that really hooked me hard in the last couple of years was Slay the Spire. Yes! Um, which combines some of both of that thing. Both the sort of turn-based... I mean, a, a, a CCG is essentially a turn-based tactical yeah. game in a lot of ways. But, but um, I really love... Uh, I played the crap out of Into the Breach as well. Yes! I knew um, you were a gentleman of taste. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
so so favorite genre of games i guess is probably that though i've i love all sorts of different types of games i really one of one one game that really made a big impact on me several years back was uh, papers please i thought was really awesome yeah um and uh i love the i love the xcom enemy unknown is great and and mario rabbits is super great too both that's both better than it has any right to be it is it's so shocking that mario rabbits is so good yeah I like you see the the idea and you're like that I don't know like Mario XCOM with rabbits for some reason and then it just the the just the execution of every aspect of that game is so good and they really refine sort of the XCOM thing to a point where it's like elegant and not overcomplicated. I mean, it's really yeah. really super good. It was interesting um, because Petula was about to ask you about uh, BattleTech or XCOM. Uh uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, XCOM, um, yeah. And I've never I've never actually played a Battletech game. I probably should, given that the, I love XCOM. Uh, the so. new one is really good. Although there's yeah. a strange quirk where it's the momentum of your robot is how you avoid um uh, getting shot up. So oh, interesting. It's very much less the like, you know, the 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 Overwatch lines of XCOM. But uh-huh. don't get me started on that, dude. I can talk about that for literal hours. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, why must I had a, a more kind of core question, which yep. is, have you ever had to deal with having creative block, and how did you overcome it? Um, mostly creative blocks. You know, I used to have... I haven't had a meaningful creative block since I've been doing this professionally. Yeah. Um, creative blocks for me are solved by deadline, generally. Um <laughs> For real, like, it's just like, you just have to do it. You don't have a choice, you know, it's like, (laughs) you, 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 you have to figure something out. And that need to do it is for me, a really good antidote to a creative block. Creative blocks for me tended to happen when I was just writing a song to write a song, you know? Yeah. And I would, I would just be like, it had to be perfect, you know? And I would just, and, and it's self-editing is really responsible for a lot of that stuff for me. And and I think the thing that, that is really helpful for creative blocks is just making a lot more stuff. And so you have, you're less precious about your ideas at that point, I think. And you, you are willing to just sort of see where something goes and can just finish your thought. And if you don't like it after that, fine, you know. Uh, but But finishing the thought <clears throat> to see if you like it is, is sometimes valuable and and just after having done it a while and making more stuff uh you just sort of understand you develop methods for yourself to get from one place to the next creatively yeah. and to to sort of figure out well here are some options for kinds of things that i could do now and you just try them out and if none of those work you try something you know you try to figure out something new but but i think you know sort of uh, developing methods for yourself to sort of work your way through that stuff is valuable. And I think also, you know, I transitioned on Bastion and Transistor. I worked at home because I was in New York and the company's based in San Francisco. And then I moved after Transistor mm. here and work out of the office four days a week now. Um, so I had to, for the first time in my life, you know, work during this period and not work during the rest of the time, you know? And so if I wanted to be productive creatively, you just kind of got to go like when it's time to do it, you know? So, so that's been really helpful actually for training away the idea of a creative block because it's, it's just, you know, it's a thing that exists, I guess, but, but does it though, (laughs) you know, does it create, you could just kind of, making anything is the solution to a creative block you know what i mean yeah um so. i wish i could master the art of not working every hour of every day but yeah i've just yeah. Ha- i've just had to accept it now um yeah. so friendos if you have any quick fire questions we've only got darren for a few more minutes before we have to sadly let him get back to actually working on hades yes um so if you've got any quick fire questions now's the time but like lord loss and everybody has been like I honestly, uh, Darren, if I'd read out all the the thank you letters, the the messages of people genuinely expressing how much the music of these games has meant to them, like we probably wouldn't have had anything else in the show. Like, <laughs> you know, I, and I am by no means immune to that. Like, it's exceptional work, and thank you. 
Um, Thank you so much. That's really sweet. Uh, also, as Great. a bit of self plug, for those of you that have come in just for the Darren interview, we are going to be rolling into a playthrough of Bastion after literally because we've had Darren on the show. I'm using that as an excuse to play Bastion. That's it. Love it. So if you want to join us after, you are more than welcome. Um, okay, so it's the quick fire round. Martin says, um, "Oh, that's not a quick question. Music you listen to in your free time? God, what are you Nowhere. listening to right now?" Knower, K N O W E R. Yep. Uh, they're they're amazing. Lewis Cole. Yep. Uh, the new That Dog album just came out. It's really good. Right. The new Darkness album just came out. It's really good. Listen to that and Joni Mitchell. Done. Um, favorite game composer. Oh gosh, that's a toughie. Uh, I'm gonna say Wintry. Next. <laughs> okay. Um, I am gonna go with. Uh, Lady Lecter says, if you were a spacefarer, what would your soundtrack be like? If I were a spacefarer? Yeah. Like you know. a like a like a traveler in space. Uh it would be uh it would be a lot of analog synthesizers, probably, and some maybe uh delayed out electric guitar. I'm gonna go with that. Um <laughs> Thelmsby's being a cheeky mother hubbard being obligatory. Is there a tentative release date for Hades? <laughs> Yeah, second half of next year is the tentative tentative release date for Hades. There we go. <laughs> yep. uh, Lizzie says, Space Ninja or Space Pirate? Space? Uh, oh. You yeah. know, I've heard of Space Pirates, but I'm going to go Space Ninja because I don't know what that is. That sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, most and least favorite instrument? Most favorite and least favorite instrument. Probably drums are the most favorite right now, just at least in terms of instruments like to play. Yep. Uh, le least favorite instrument? Gosh, they all have merit, don't they? Maybe bagpipes? I'm sorry to any pipers out there. But <laughs> I just can't figure out like a way to use a bagpipe in music. Well, I've <laughs> I've never challenged a person live on stream yeah. before, but I'm gonna do it now. Yeah. Darren, yeah. So one of these days, you've got to put bagpipes in the track. That is your, that's Aww. your challenge now. I would, have like, you know... I would have picked something else if I knew I was going to get challenged to do it after. <laughs> I mean, if you'd oh. said, like, the triangle, I probably wouldn't have challenged you there, but... I, you triangle know, easy. Yeah. What do you do with bagpipes? I, exactly. That's a, that's a journey right there. It's tough. It's really tough. That's a tough one. Uh, DX Man says, any genres you haven't tried that you'd love to explore? Oh, uh, that's interesting. Um, I, yes. I mean, I think... In terms of stuff I've done for games, I'd love to do something a little more raw and like uh, like garage rock would be really fun if there were an appropriate game for that kind of thing. Because I that's that's a thing, an unexplored avenue of stuff that I like. Um, right, and friends, we have caught up. Uh, there were a couple of questions about like favorite game and things like that. We've mm -hmm. covered those earlier in the show, so yeah. Rock band, rock band two, maybe. <laughs> I mean, it <laughs> could still game? happen. Uh, rock, she, no, rock Band 2, Rock Band 2, I think, was is one of my favorite games. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, in answer to that, yeah, no, yeah. I was going off on a weird tangent. It is a shame that yeah. the, the the plastic instrument craze did keel over. I'm still I'm still cranking on Rock Band 4 on a regular basis. So I bust it out. Yeah. Play, and, you know, um, did you ever you quickly, might... did you ever try Drop Mix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a card in Drop Mix actually. Uh, it was like a PAX exclusive. There's a what? Flutterfly from from Pyre. Yeah. What? Yep. <laughs> oh, lordy, lordy. Okay. Oh, and Lecter's like, uh, it'll never die. I have that card. You activated <laughs> your Darren Corp card. Awesome. All right. So, Darren, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, You know, if you ever want to do this again, you have an open invite, my friend. Awesome. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, especially considering your taste in video games, I'm like, you'll 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 get along here. You get along here, it's fine. <laughs> It'll line up, cool. Um, so, yeah, ladies, gentlemen, and individuals of all persuasions, please join me again in thanking Darren for being a cracking guest, cracking composer, and a cracking human. Thanks for having me. I do. You are entirely welcome. But if you let me continue to talk, I will talk ad infinitum. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right cool well yeah i should probably run i gotta get back to work but uh but yeah it's been good yeah thanks thanks for the questions everybody and thanks for the really sweet things that everybody had to say <laughs> about the music that's 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 really sweet so thanks again
Tony Wall. Thank you, dude. All right, we'll see you later. Uh, bye. Pushing buttons. Pushing buttons. So, yeah, everybody. No big deal. Just Darren bloody Corb on the show. No big deal. God, that was fucking brilliant. And, yeah, I I guess just to restate the, the core little takeaways from that was that, you know, if you are working on a game project, if you're working for audio stuff, there's nothing stopping you from folding that in as part of the core experience. And, yeah, as finding out that Bastion was basically recorded in a makeshift setup in Darren's apartment. And when I say makeshift, he was saying that the audio booth was a closet and they just draped a bunch of like big ass, um, uh, big ass blankets and stuff over it to create like a little bit of a dampening thing. Like, yo, as Martin's saying, in this fucking closet. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Patch is like, next time, Frank Kabaki. I don't know Frank. Actually, do I know Frank? Hang on, let me just quickly Google that. See. Oh heck! He's the guy that did Hell March. All right, I will. I will have to. I'll try and reach out. It won't be tomorrow. I promise you that much. <laughs> so, ladies, gentlemen, and individuals of all persuasions. Firstly, if we have a bear... yay! Okay, so even if you say otherwise, I am still sorry for interrupting earlier. It was poor judgment on my part, and I take responsibility for that much, at least. No, 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 uh, Dika. Usually, you know, I'm happy to accept your bits. Um, you have nothing to apologize for, friends. I was trying to get the balance mixes, um, and Darren was quite quiet, so I was busting up a bunch of the audio and completely forgot about alert noises, which I should have adjusted ahead of time. You should never apologize for keeping this operation Stop running. Clicking. Yo! All right, now it's kicking off. So, friends, some anonymous mother hubbard just gave out five subs to Time Lord Varnish... Wymus, Wonderful Rush, Fire Burns, and Peros Unlimited. That's fecking cool of you. Antika, thank you for the bits. Okay, very quickly, for those of you who have just found us, uh, I do a lot of interviews with a lot of games interview individuals. I try and do one every Thursday where possible. Uh, I believe next week we have a journalist from Kentucky who's going to be on our show talking about what it's like being a... Stop that incessant clicking. Uh, what it's like being a journo in the, the current climate. Uh, I used to work in the games industry. I did 10 years. And now I do this full time. So when I say thank you to people like Tika, when I say thank you to whoever that anonymous Mother Hubbard was from House... From House Carl! I mean it because we're entirely funded by, you know, everyone here. So yeah, if you came in for Darren... Don't go away, because we are going to be rolling into Bastion in just a second. But I do need to go for a monstrous wee, because I, inha inhaled, an I inhaled an inordinate amount of, uh, of coffee and water. So, you'll have to, you'll have to bear with me a second. Uh, TSCTH says, if I could choose your next guest, it would be Akumi Nakarama. Yes! But uh, she is currently touring all over the place. Uh, I don't know her personally. Uh, I would love to have her on the show. Uh, I also have a feeling that she might not be ready to talk about what she's up to next. Uh, because she did leave... Uh, was it Bethesda? She was with... Stop Fire. that incessant clicking! Was it Bethesda? No. God, my brain's gone completely jello. Um, so at the moment, she I don't believe she's announced what she's doing after... Um, I mean, Feck would love to have Keanu on the show, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Kers was like, I came here for you, you numpty! <laughs> so Kershaw, everyone, thank you. I'm just fecking chuff we got Darren on. So, friends, uh, I'm going to take uh, a quick two-minute break. I will leave you with the wonderful uh, chilling tunes of the Pyre soundtrack. And... Oh, uh, Alpha said left uh, Tango Gameworks. Okay, yes. Yeah, Dismook! Darren Corb. And friends, I, I can't say enough great things about Darren. Um, Darren uh, is not someone that I've like known from crazy drinking stories or otherwise. I literally, after the, uh, the PAX gig, I went by the booth the day after and Darren was working there. And I was like, oh, hey, how's it going? I'd love to have you on the show. I'd love to talk about what you do and how that encompasses gaming. And sorry to restate the things we were talking about earlier, but like, 
the thing that I love so much with Super Giants games is that every artistic discipline that goes into their titles sits at a similar rank. You know, the music and sound design is held to the same, it is is uh, on par with the art style, on par with the gameplay design, on par with like the mechanics of the engine. Everything is created in step and it creates this wonderful, wonderful feeling. That that element that makes Super Giants games like really snap is that, especially with uh, Transistor, the audio not only matches the game perfectly, but is part of you know, it is part of the narrative, it's part of the experience, and the audio and sound design, the music, like, takes all of that and encompasses it entirely. You cannot say, okay, I love, love Let It Die With Passion. That game has a phenomenal soundtrack, but that was a, a lot of commission work, and it's hilarious that every song on the Let It Die soundtrack is called Let It Die, but it was definitely created after the fact. You know, the music is good, yes, but does it fit the the tonal? Maybe, but if only because Let It Die's, you know, artistic palette is eclectic and at times schizophrenic as to what it wants to be. You know what I'm saying? But Transistor, I mean, it is a story about an iconic singer who loses their main, who loses their voice, their, their, their craft, their art, their communication is all taken from them. And this is their story. So yeah. Getting Darren on here, it's a feckin' great day, all right? All right, okay, Lizzie, yes, I'll go get some water. I'm gonna get a cup of tea. So, friendos, we are gonna be rolling onto Bastion in just a sec. So let me, uh, let me pop that, let's pop that soundtrack up a little bit. Get them, get them jams playing. Yeah! So, don't you go anywhere, because, hey! Stooge, you just missed the party! We have ourselves a tiny raid! Alright, friendos. Uh, TSCTH, that is a good point, and I do apologize for that one. Uh, I do feel that... With a lot of those terms, it can be easy to throw them into, like, common language, and I'm doing my best to... I'm doing best to taper them out. Right, friendos, I'm just going to grab myself a cup of tea very, very quickly, and then we're going to roll on. But yeah, I am very sorry to uh, Stooges Raid, as you, uh, you have unfortunately missed Darren. So, you're, you'll miss out on a gem there. Anyway, the VOD will be up, I'll highlight it at the end of the show, it'll be a thing you can watch here, and then I'll throw it on YouTube tomorrow. Um, so if you have missed it, you can go back and watch it, but I desperately need a, a cuppa. Oh, no, and TSCTH, I entirely understand. That was on myself, and it is one of those terms I'm trying to cut from my vocab, so I do apologize. Right, I'll be back in just a second. <laughs> 